Hello everyone, good afternoon. My name is Tobias and I'm here together with Colin, John and Adam and we are the RSC team of the National National Data Center. So in the talk today, we will give you an overview about cloud optimized data formats. And doing in the end, we will present two examples for doing that. So one, uh, the first one example, it's an environmental digital twin project that we are building in NLC for a marine protected area uh, in the South Sea. So I will show you later where is this place. So the main challenge of this project is how we can display in our website for the public big raster and big vector files uh, that we would not have to wait a lot of time to handle this, this type of data in the front end. So for the, the geospatial raster data, we choose to work with cloud optimized GeoTIFF, COC. The cloud optimized GeoTIFF format comes from the GeoTIFF and the GeoTIFF format comes from the TIFF. So GeoTIFF, uh, TIFF, it's a, uh, GeoTIFF, it's a format to store Georeference and geo code information in a TIFF compliant raster file. So a TIFF file is organized by header and image file directors. So in the header, you have the information about the locations of the each part of the image file directory. And each pixel in a TIFF file represents a data value. The difference between geo TIFF and TIFF is that you have some geo key tags in the geo TIFF file, for example, projections, as we are working with geospatial data. And uh, we we also we we can also have several several layers in the GeoTIFF file. So instead of only RGB, we can have more than 10, 12, whatever, how many layers that you want to use. And each layer can represent a different type of data set. For example, a different uh, bands of your satellite. Uh, and so a wonderful thing about GeoTIFF that it's a platform dependent, so you will not have difficult to work with these data formats in different uh, platforms. So the cloud optimizer TIFF, they get this idea of the internal organization of the GeoTIFF file, and it's they 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 get this, 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 this idea of organization and organize it in a different way that allow the user to decompress and load the data separately. So instead of get, for example, if we have a one gigabyte of data, instead of the load the one gigabyte, we can get just a part of the data to show in your front end. So uh, the client, the web, the, your web client can issue some HTTP range request on our object store, for example, S3 buckets or uh, GCP, or uh, in our project we are using Jasmine. So we can issue some HTTP get range request on that and get just the part of the file that you need. So we can get just a tile or just a layer instead of get everything. And one good thing about uh, COG files that it includes overviews. So if you don't want a low, a high resolution image, you don't want to download the high resolution. You can download a low resolution image, and uh, it's it's a quite easy to create file. So with just a few lines of code in Python, in Jadao, or with KGOS, we can create a file like that. You can convert a GeoTIFF to COG, and it's legacy compatible. So if you if you have a system that it works for GeoTIFF, it too works for COG files. For the vector data, uh, we need to find a different approach as in vector files, the data is not saved. Uh, it's not saved as as grid in a grid data format. It's saved as polygons and points. So the first approach that we can we can think about, oh, we can try to convert these polygons and points to a uh, image. But if you do that, we can in the end lose resolution or create a big big raster file with unnecessary information. So our approach was we need to work with vector in the, its own format. So the possible solution is flash, flat, flat geo buff and MB tiles. The first one, flat geo buff, it's a, it's a format uh, that was created by Google and now it's open source. So it's, it's the only format that was built to enable the HTTP uh, range request. Or say it's the first format, the only format that worked the same way that the cloud optimizer TIFF. So it aims to enable large volume of static data with streaming and handle access. So it's wonderful if you want to see, if you want to see maps in a zoom in uh, view, but you have a lot of problems, uh, handling problems. It takes a, lot, a long time to handle if you want to see in a large overview. So that's why in this project, we choose not to use flat buffing. 
so in the end, we choose to we, we, we are working with MB tiles. So MB tiles, how can I say it's the idea of them is MB tiles, you convert your shape file, your geodeson file to a SQLite database that it's organized by with metadata and tiles. And uh, you, you perform your queries based on the tiles on the overview to get the data that you need instead of get all the SQLite database or go the all the ship file or all the JSON. So one MB tiles, one SQLite file can represent a, represent a single tile set, but could include a grid of interactive data and multiple tile sets, layers or maps can be represented by multiple SQLite files and MB tiles files. And as it is a database, you don't need to download everything. You only get part of the data that we need when you, you, you perform a query on that. So this is a simple architecture of our project. So just to have an idea of how, how it works for the front end people. So uh, we have a data, uh, some data processing tool that's getting data from different type of formats. And we convert it to cloud optimized formats like COG and MB tiles. And we perform HTTP range requests from the web client to the objects store uh, to get the data and show the data in the front end. And when you have the data in the front end, we can apply some JavaScript libraries uh, that we uh, we can treat the data in the front end. So with that, uh, we can we don't need a, a, a huge uh, backend computational resource. We can do everything on the front end with just a few JavaScript libraries. So to make things better, uh, we are using in the middle of that, in the, in the middle of that, some dynamic tile servers that it helps the front end, the front end, the web client to uh, better to get to, to, to do the cloud automatic part in a better way. So I, we are using this project for the tile, the dynamic tile part. Uh, two tile servers, one for the cloud automation and one for the MB tiles. So um, the the first one we are using now open source one called tile that we changed some a little bit to adapt to our project. And the second one we built some Python codes to do the queries on the MB tile to the SQLite file to get just the part of the file, just the part of the file that we need from the objects store. And the wonderful thing about these two tiles, these two tiles stuff, that they are synchronous, event driven, and we have really good eff efficient memorization, and they are really lightweight. You don't need a, 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 a huge computational resource to maintain it. So I will do a live demonstration. So I hope everything will work well. Check it. Yes, I checked everything, but as you know, yeah, live demonstration. So this is the uh, area. Yes, so this is the head price area. So you can see that's in the South Sea and close to the UK. So I can exit, for example, a bathymetry layer, Jabico. This file has more than one gigabyte of uh, size. And you can see that it's loading, it's loading uh, very quickly in the front end. You can see that it's loading like, like tiles. Uh, I can interact with the layer. So you can see that while I'm hover in the this bottom box here, the bathymet is up, it's updating. So I interact with the layer in the, in the real time. And uh, I can also perform some graphs. So everything in the front end. So uh, without need to have anything in the back end. Um, and uh, if you have something like 3D, we can also convert the data to uh, a 3D interview. So we can also convert the, the pixels to a 3D overview in the front end and show it in a one gigabyte file in the real time for the user. And for the MB tiles, so I hope it will work because I had some problems earlier, but oh, yeah, so uh, for the MB tiles, uh, I don't know if it works, but uh, oh, it's open. So it's takes like some time. So you can see that it's loading the same way. When you zoom in and zoom out, you, oh, you can see that you have some change in the polygons because when you zoom in, uh, uh, the front end is performing new queries to the new HTTP requests and to get new part, new, new polygons. 
and you can also interact with the layer because now the, the data is on the front end. So you can get information of the polygons in real time just to click it. And I'm not doing here any access to the back end in this time. Everything's on the front end to show to the user. So I think that's it. So, thank you. Um, okay, uh, so I am João Morado and uh, I'll present the second project uh, about uh, usage of uh, cloud approaches to presentation of environmental data. Um, so uh, in this segment, I'll focus on um, approaches to store uh, ocean general circulation models uh, in the cloud. And um, specifically, uh, there are very various challenges we must address in order to do this in an efficient way. So first and foremost, we must uh, understand and um, uh, define what's the most adequate data format for this. So these data sets that are produced by the simulations, they are us usually composed of uh, hundreds or thousands of NetCDF files that sum up to terabytes of data. And we must decide if we want to keep the data in its original form and then aggregate it using a library such as Kershank. Or if on the other hand, uh, we want to convert it to a more cloud-friendly data format such as ZAR. Uh, furthermore, we must decide uh, uh, what is the best uh, uh, chunking strategy. And this is because the, the way in, in which we partition the data has an impact on the efficiency uh, with which uh, the operations are done on these data sets. And finally, um, we have to transfer and update these multi terabyte data sets to the cloud, and uh, we have to find approaches to do this uh, as efficiently as possible. So I'll start by discussing uh, uh, the data formats and the chunking strategies. One of the most popular data formats uh, is uh, ZAR, uh, which is open source, uh, and it is used for the storage of chunk, compressed, and dimensional arrays. Uh, and it can store arrays basically on memory, disk, uh, S3, uh, et cetera. It allows for fast and parallel access to array data, and it integrates with the popular Python libraries such as NumPy, Dask, which is a, many of you know it for sure, a parallel computing library, and X-Array, which is very powerful uh, to manipulate and analyze and visualize uh, complex scientific data because it offers many data structures and functions that can be used uh, to, to work with uh, label multi-dimensional arrays. So on the... The figure on the right side shows the typical format, uh, a typical ZAR file, so a uh, ZAR data set. So basically, uh, in ZAR, an array is written as a set of uh, compressed binary chunks, uh, and uh, each chunk is written to its own file. And this differs fundamentally from uh, other uh, file formats, data formats such as the cloud optimized relative that Tobias was just talking about. Because, for example, in uh, uh, cloud optimized relative, we have just one, a single file uh, that handles HTTP get range requests. Whereas here we have uh, multiple files that can be accessed through a single uh, get and uh, potentially uh, asynchronously. Uh, an alternative approach is to use the Kerchunk library, which provides a unified way to represent uh, a variety of chunk compressed data formats uh, common in environmental sciences, such as NetCDF, uh, TIFF, etc. Um, Kerchunk does this by extracting the byte ranges of the chunks, uh, compression information, uh, and other uh, metadata. And this metadata is stored in JSON files that are compliant with the ZAR specifications, uh, enabling uh, all the parallel uh, capabilities that the ZAR library also offers. Uh, another of its advantages is that uh, you can aggregate multiple uh, NetCDF files into a single data set. So you can aggregate uh, multiple files that are stored in the same data format, but you can also aggregate files that have different data formats. And that's quite powerful. Uh, so um, the advantage of this library is, of course, that it eliminates uh, the requirement to, uh, of conversion to a cloud-native data format such as ZAM. Um, so both at this point, both data form, so both the current chunk library or ZAR seems suitable 
uh, for us to store our data sets. And we decided to uh, do some performance studies. Um, for this purpose, uh, we created uh, data sets uh, for seawater salinity based on uh, the NO6 free analysis data set for 2015. So this data set has basically four dimensions. Uh, we used like 12 months, and then it has depth, uh, why, uh, like the three spatial dimensions, basically. Uh, and we created different uh, data sets with different chunking schemes. So for example, the ones in the red box, uh, we kept the original chunking that was present uh, uh, in, the, in the original NetCDF files. Uh, and uh, we used the cut chunk to aggregate our NetCDF files. And we also uh, converted uh, it to ZAR. So we, we have two data sets here. In the black box, uh, all the data sets are in the ZAR format. Uh, we use the coarser uh, granularity for the Y and X dimensions and uh, attempt a different chunking strategy for the depth and the uh, time dimensions. Uh, finally, uh, in the green box, uh, we have uh, data sets also in the ZAR format and uh, we did not chunk the Y and X dimensions. We kept the depth dimension uh, with the same granularity and uh, time uh, was either chunked monthly or quarterly. So we store these data sets in the Jasmine object store and then uh, perform different operations to understand what's the performance we get. Uh, so the different operations we perform were calculating the annual mean depth profile at a specific grid point, the annual mean of the surface layer, the area average for the 12 months, and the um, depth average also for the 12 months. So the main conclusion here is that in absolute terms, the cat chunk data set, which is represented in blue, uh, gives lower performance than its ZAR counterparts, which is represented in uh, orange. Uh, so this kind of led us to discard the, uh, for now, care chunk as uh, uh, the, the, the library to use to store these data sets. And uh, in the end, we decided to proceed uh, uh, with uh, uh, the data set that had uh, one value uh, for the time, uh, five for the depth, and 577 for the Y and X dimensions. Uh, well, we could have chosen others, but... Uh, we prefer to choose one which has uh, a data set in which the chunks are not very large because as we will see uh, just now, uh, this also gives better uh, scaling properties. So exactly talking about scaling properties, we performed, uh, uh, we assessed the parallel strong scaling in a single node with 16 cores that's on the top image and uh, on, on multiple nodes that's in the bottom figure. So while uh, if, if we take a look at the line in blue, which corresponds to the Kerchunk one, so while it does not scale very well uh, for one node, uh, it, uh, as the number of nodes increases, it reaches a, a synthetic equivalence with ZAR. And this kind of agrees with the claims of the developers. So in absolute terms, it's not as, it's not as good as ZAR, but it's still uh, an efficient way to access these data sets on the object store and it eliminates the need for data conversion. Furthermore, for the single node case, we got uh, uh, probability efficiencies of, of about uh, 50 to 90%. Obviously, uh, no speed up when the number of cores is greater than the number of chunks. And um, uh, yeah, so the, the chunking uh, scheme we, we, we chose is the one that's in green. So this also shows that uh, uh, smaller chunks uh, and uh, uh, a good strategy for chunking uh, give the best results in terms of performance. So at this point, we knew that we were going to use ZAR. Uh, we had decided on the uh, chunking strategy. So uh, what was left to do was to find uh, approaches to transfer this data efficiently to the object store. And for this purpose, we developed a package called vPipeline, in which you can use your uh, create bespoke data pipelines, uh, your own, own workflows. Um, so I, I, I will not talk much about this uh, because I just have one minute left, and I have presented a poster about it. So if you can, if you want to to know more about this work, you can uh, just read the poster online. Uh, but basically, we 
in this specific example, and because pipeline integrates with popular uh, uh, parallel libraries, we were able to transfer two terabytes of data uh, in eight hours using two nodes, uh, 16 cores per node and four cores per file. Uh, once we have this uh, data set in the object store, you can, it can be easily accessed using uh, multiple libraries, uh, for example, X-Ray uh, and NetCDFC. And for instance, X-Ray is a very powerful way of accessing these data sets because it offers a uh, nice way to analyze, visualize, manipulate, manipulate this data via chunks and in parallel and uh, the power of these libraries basically you can treat it almost as a black box uh, if you if you don't care much about efficiency uh, but yeah you can treat it as a black, black box because everything is done uh, under the hood um, and that's it for us uh, we welcome uh, any questions that you may have Brilliant. Uh... Thank you very much. Uh, there's one question at the moment, but please do submit a few more if you've got them. Um, yes, I will. That's true. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think for the first couple of speakers, or sorry, the first speaker, there's a question. Um, are, Zarg, are, Zarg, are the ZAR compatible JSON files space efficient? Um, so, uh, yeah, so unless you are using, uh, I, I guess, space efficiency, you are referring to in terms of size, right? Yes. I guess uh, unless, uh, unless you are uh, trying to aggregate uh, hundreds of terabytes, they are uh, space, space efficient, yes. Uh, the problem becomes when you are trying to aggregate like these ultra massive uh, data sets. Uh, I know that there are uh, new approaches being developed to kind of address that, uh, that uh, basically chunk uh, the JSON file itself so that you don't have to uh, open everything when you just want to access a little chunk in the middle. Uh, but uh, yeah, I would say that for most applications, they are uh, uh, yeah, efficient. Um, I had a question. So you put a lot of work into developing those sort of visualizations and getting them to come out efficiently. How easy do you think it would be to adapt that if sort of some people with other data sets wanted to display something? Um, so how easy would it be for them to take some between what you've done? I don't think it would be difficult because uh, as I told you, so, sorry, sorry, as I told you, uh, it's really easy to convert data, each, each type of grid data format to cloud optimized routine. So just a few lines of codes in Python can convert it. <laughs> Uh, if you save it in objects to store, and if you build, how can I say? I didn't, I didn't talk about that. But uh, if you work with this type of data, uh, normally you have to have a, a stack catalog to 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 organize your data in the object store. So if you save it in object store, and if you build your stack catalog, you can uh, easily show this data on the front end. It's not, it's not difficult. Yeah. 